to welcome our speakers, we have Lisa and Nicholas. Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself to the community? Yeah, hey everyone. My name is Lisa Geffner. I work at Realtor.com. I'm head of design operations there, and I'm really excited to be in presenting in one of my first friends of Figma. So thanks for inviting me. Love it. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Nicholas, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Well, actually, I'm a pretty much a newcomer, and that's also my first my first time here with you, Farid. I'm in the design ops team of Orange, which is a huge telecommunication group. And actually, I'm also a design system designer in the, in the team for around 200 adopters designers. Yeah. Love it. So we can go into the current challenges section. And we have a couple of questions here. So let's discuss that. But Lisa and Nicholas, based on these votes, do you have any reactions or observations from your perspective? Lisa, will you want to start? Do you want to start, Lisa? Oh, go for it. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, you can see that I'm pretty much positive on the first, <laughs> on the first one uh, because mm -hmm. it, it's sure that there is a lot of awesome opportunities by using the mod. I think about uh, the, just the development tag with the section. This one was actually a game changer because it tackled one of our main pain that we had before the dev mod. It was how the developers were actually uh, were lost during the end of process. They were mm -hmm. lost on the, on the Figma file. That one of the part of our particular context at Orange. So there are a lot of actually exciting features that's for sure. But yeah, I see that there is a, a middle people too. <laughs> what do you think, Lisa? Yeah, I think for our team, there has been quick adoption with some teams and other teams has been lagging behind. With the teams that have been using it, that handoff process has been a lot smoother. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, I think there are some disadvantages to some of the teams that maybe aren't using it as quickly as others. And I think some designers that are working across a couple different teams, it's like they're working with devs that are in dev mode and ones that aren't. And so that's causing some confusion, I think, across teams, mm -hmm. which makes it a little difficult. But overall, I feel like it's been very positive. I think where we start getting into further on down, looking at feedback and if we're actually going to scale there's some questions i think about which i was telling farid before we jumped on this call we have purchased some tools recently that maybe dev mode could use but our content designers are using it or our accessibility team is is using some products that we just recently bought so there's that question of is it worth it to scale and use this or continue with the current contracts that we have that's a really good point. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I, I feel it will be really valuable to hear other thoughts and observations from the people who are attending the, the session as well. So if you have any interesting stories or interesting questions or interesting blockers that we need to think in advance, please share them. And also important, one important thing here, we have Q&A section here at the bottom. So if you have any questions, feel free to Ask them here, we'll come back here in a second and we'll be able to answer some of them. But I would like to go into the early feedback. The, let me just pull this board to the Fig Jam. So I would love to hear your early observations, early feedback with your teams. Nicholas, would you like to start? And please yeah, um... highlight yourself. By clicking on the top right corner, you can click on your own user picture and click on Spotlight Me so we could follow you. Yeah, actually, this part for me was important. It's just about the context of Orange because each response from me are dr driven by the context. We're actually two design system designers. We are handling four design systems. 
We don't have any developers in the core design system team, so it's inner source, inner source, sorry. But despite that, we have some huge metrics with two million insertion uh, of component during six months. And we have, in that context, we have to handle the, the how to say that, the onboarding of every designers and every developers on Figma because we make we made the switch pretty recently between Sketch and Figma. So actually, it's pretty siloed between the designers and the dev. And knowing that, uh, one of my main attention about the dev mode was how it could allow even me to uh, create more interaction with my developers from my design system. And so that, that's one of my main feedback about it, is that it allows me to create a real interaction and real we, we real read between uh, my designers, my developers, sorry, and, and me. So uh, because I was like, hey, look at me, I have awesome news to show you on Figma. There is a lot of, a lot of new features that will definitely interest you. And uh, we feel like now Figma want definitely the developers to be more um, handled by the tool. And so I use that opportunity to go to them with this gift. And for the moment, the early adopters of the dev mode are pretty much the designers that are the, the more, how to say that, that are the best on the tool because we have a, a huge gap between the, the pretty much beginners on Figma and the pretty much experts on Figma. We have, as I said, 200, 200 designers mm -hmm. uh, to handle. So we just try to create some champions of the dev mm -hmm. mode that will then create some feedback for the rest of the community at Orange. That's one of my, yeah. And, my and how, was, how was your experience and observations from the teams who are moving from Zeppelin to Figma? Did they say, <laughs> oh, it's the same or it's worse uh, or it's better? It was, yeah, it was, uh, one of the painful parts. Uh, because, uh, well, we have uh, some, uh, actually, we are working on a featured team. So with 200 designers, we can say that we have maybe 100, 1,000 uh, developers behind them. Um, and uh, knowing that, uh, it's uh, really complicated. What was the question? Sorry. The question was, what kind of feedback engineers shared after transitioning from Zeppelin to Yeah, from Zeppelin. Figma. So uh, we had to think about how to create a new versioning, pro versioning process. That was one of my main, main parts <laughs> when I arrived in, in Orange. I, I will be able to show you how I, I've done that. But it was actually, I went to, to some other design system managers from the France from the world France, just to know, to understand how they handle the versioning. So some are using branches, some are using dedicated end of files. The first assumption that we have made at Orange was to create some dedicated pages because we could not create dedicated files because of the all the different projects that will be created within one pro one project from Figma. So at the end, we handled it by creating a whole workflow to show to the designers how to use branches in Figma. Mm -hmm. And that was our way of handling it. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, I hope Figma will pretty much work on that particular subject of a versioning and end of. Because for the moment, I feel there is not a, a really a huge response on this pain. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I really love some of your highlights that sometimes uh, right now 
if teams are switching from other tools, there is first phase of adoption. People might share some feedback of what kind of things they like or what kind of things they don't like. And we could adjust the playbooks, adjust the onboarding materials based on the questions that they will be asking. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing. Lisa, would you like to share some of your highlights, observations, maybe positive or negative feedback? So we'd love to hear that. Yeah, I think for us, our, our team has been in Figma for a while. I think we've been in Figma since 2020. And a lot of it is based around this price change and what is going to happen. Our team is around 60 designers. And then on every squad, we have roughly seven to 10 engineers. And right now we are debating between if that price change makes sense in 2024. So some teams are using dev mode, other teams aren't. And I think that's the real catch is what happens if some of these teams that are in dev mode right now, what will happen then? <laughs> will it go back to then just saying, okay, we're going to be using the inspect tool, which dev mode has essentially taken over right now. And then also what's going to happen to that toggle? Is that just going to be gone? To me, the toggle interface is a little interesting anyway. It's great right now as a designer to be able to kind of go back and forth and for engineering too. But a lot of our engineers aren't in Figma. They're just in viewer mode when they're in Figma. So paying for that seat is going to be pretty expensive for us. And then I think the other thing too that I mentioned before, working with our accessibility team and our content team, we're QAing things in a very different way for the teams that have documentation around how to do handoff and we have playbooks for that. But now that we have dev mode, some of those things are being replaced with certain content you can change easily within dev mode and you can look at the different prototypes. And so I think there tends to be this confusion around teams of, is this something we want to mandate? Is this something we want to pay for? What's going to happen when we go back if we say, no, we're not going to be using dev mode in 2024. So the current playbooks we have, I've been trying to update them for the teams that are using dev mode. And it's, I feel like there's just a lot of back and forth and gray area right now. I think it's great that Figma's giving this beta to us to use and test and learn. But I think I've seen some concern from other teams just within different Slack channels and talking to other design ops leaders of if we are a smaller team and we only have this fixed budget that we've already put into Figma right now, can we afford then to move into dev mode? So yeah, I think there's just a lot of questions around that. It's interesting. Did you say that, did you think about what kind of success criteria of this initiatives, initiative is? Are you thinking about setting up if there is adoption higher than 20%, we can invest in dev mode. Or if there are really positive feedback from the teams, we could move into dev mode. Or thinking about adoption, maybe give access to dev mode only for high bet teams or really strategic teams so they, they could work faster. Do, did you set up any criteria of success of this testing? Yeah, so right now we're in a little bit of a sticky situation. We are actually going to be moving into a completely new design system or design uplift in the middle of August. So all of our willingness to try and get everyone to move into dev mode has been put on pause just because we're updating our design system so we can't really connect it to storybook yet. So we're not necessarily getting accurate data on which teams are going to be using what components because some teams are using our old storybook, other teams are using our new storybook. And so there's just a lot of gray area right now as to setting up those success metrics and saying which teams are going to be using it. Um, but funny enough, I did actually start setting up a survey just to find out from the teams who's using it and then what are the pain points, what are the success stories that are coming out of it, what makes it better than currently. 
are QAing what we're doing right now because there's always pain points around QA. And especially now with moving into this new design system, we're doing a whole, all of our teams are going through major VQA right now. <laughs> so as much as I want to try and push that forward and set up those success metrics, I don't think I can really get any really strong indications until we move into this new design system in the middle of August. But to your point, Fareed, I do think it's important that if I were to say, okay, our teams that absolutely need it, mm -hmm. what is that percentage and what is that going to look between now and then December of 2023? Yeah, that's a good point. And I also, I, I wish we could have more engineers on this call. I tried to invite developer advocates from Figma, but everyone is on vacation right now. So it's hard to gather people around. But my question was, I was trying to think about different approaches, how people could try and test these kind of new tools. And one of the ideas here is what if we will have chain champions from design and from engineering side, from design, we don't need to care about that as much as engineering side. And if we will have this engineering chain champions. And after 2024, they will have access to this dev mode license, right? So we will not scale that to all. 100% of all engineers will just try with first 10%, right? And But at the same time, I'm curious to know from engineering perspective, I feel like in engineering world, they are always interested not only on doing the visual part, they're more interested about the logic and the business logic on behind it, working on the scripts rather than just making pixel perfect designs available in the, in the code itself, right? And if they will sign up for this engineering chain champions program and they will get this license, then the whole engineering team will say, oh, you are now responsible for pixel perfect design. So, and it's maybe for some people it will be well, a downshifting in their role. So I'm curious to know this perspective as well in the future when people will be scaling that, how engineers will feel about that as well. But I see a lot of questions regarding the pricing mode and regarding the inspect mode. Will it be deprecated when in 2024? And there was a office hours from Figma recently conducted. And I just wanted to share some of the highlights here. So yes, the inspect mode will be available it's not going anywhere, right? Even if people don't want to move or try dev mode, they will still have access to inspect. So nothing is changing there from experience perspective. But my thoughts on that is that, yes, if we are going to scale that to engineers, and I was telling to other people as well, it's so expensive, $25 when Big Jam, when they just introduced that, it was only $5. And on the market, it was cheaper than other tools, Miro, Lucid and others. So I'm not sure how this pricing is going to work out. Hopefully with, if we will share more feedback, they will listen. I'm sure they're listening. So if they could make a little less expensive, that will be, I guess, um, more easier for people to scale in the future. Great. Let's go back into the questions. So we have two questions here. The first one is curious how dev mode is intended to work with existing design systems. Yeah, actually for the moment, unfortunately we have, we don't have any dedicated developers in our team. So as I said, it's inner source, uh, process. So we have weeklies, which, which are called code review, code review. But for the moment, we haven't absolutely not introduced the dev mode during our process. It's much more, we, we go through uh, Jira tickets and through just sharing design Figma files, but with the normal, the normal link. So I could not be able to answer that, but I'm pretty sure that it actually impacts the design system end off as much as other product in development mm -hmm. because it's the same. You have to, to be able to communicate with the developers. You have to, to agree with them. You have mm -hmm. to, yeah, you have to do everything. 
just if it was a normal product. So I think the, the result is pretty much the same. Yeah, and from my perspective, I feel like the most important value proposition here is connection with variables. Because when you're using the Visual Studio code, all the code suggestions and all the complaints are taking into the consideration all the variables that designers are using. And I feel when with autocomplete feature, and if we have the right design tokens within our design system, and designers are using variables within their design deliverables, this variables adoption, design token adoption, could be accelerated by using the F mode because it will highlight, it will autocomplete by taking into consideration all the variables that designer used. So I feel like that will accelerate adoption, but yeah, it's interesting thought discussion. Lisa, do you have any observations, uh, answers on, on that, or do you want to move to another question? Yeah, I agree. I think it'll definitely help with variables. One problem that we're running into right now is our component names. And um, that is causing a lot of confusion with our engineers on our design system team. And then figuring out what is a better way to name our components. So right now we, for instance, have many different variables and I was just talking to my director for our design systems and she was saying that they'll see body 300 medium when they're looking through the list of CSS values and it's, we need to be better about naming our components so that way there still isn't that confusion, but then also just making it stronger that our devs understand what is it that <laughs> we're intending to name our components and just being more cognizant of that. Yeah. Okay. Beside that, actually, the dev mod allows us, of course, to see much more easier all the documentation dedicated to each component. And uh, what is, I think, pretty much game changer here is how the props are actually visible when you click on a linked variant of uh, instance of a component. You can, you can pretty much see everything really clearly. And I think I haven't seen for the moment any developers using it, but I think the sandbox mode, uh, which allow us to play, play as we want with all the properties of a component, I think that will pretty much help the developers to understand how the, the component have to interact and what is his behavior. So I would like I would love to have more insight on, on this, and then I will definitely talk about this. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Another question that I really like from Brian, how do you tell if far-flung teams are using the beta of dev mode? So I can share some observations on my side. If we, In Figma API, there is a way to understand if, the, if there is a specific section that is ready for the dev mode or not. So, Brian, if you want, we could discuss that together. But there is a way to pull this information from every file. And if we will scale that to all projects and all the teams, we will be able to see the adoption of the dev mode through this Figma API. You will need to develop your own solutions, but you could do that in the Conda pack as well. And with that, by going through all the files that we have, and in most of the cases, it's thousands of files, but it's feasible, we could understand the adoption, which teams are using that mode by setting up from design side, which sections or which frames are ready for the dev mode. So this is the way how we could track that. I was thinking to develop, to finalize my code pack on that. Maybe it will be interesting point to discuss as well. Another question is, could you guys walk through the current can over process and what problems will dev mode be solved? Yeah, I can start with that. So I'd say the biggest problem that we have in our handover process is our QA and our annotations for that. I think a lot of our teams or, or designers do it in many different ways. I I have toolkits and processes for how to have the handoff between developers and 
designers and it still sometimes falls through the cracks with some teams. And we were using annotated, I think, but then that turned into a paywall. So some of our designers quit using that. Some people end up putting sticky notes within their files or just putting a specific notes within their files or having a for dev only page within their files. And with dev mode, I think that having that frame around it saying ready for dev has been such a game changer. So they know this is the final design. I think also that there's, I forget the name of it, but it's the, what the last update to that design is also in dev mode, which has been really great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also just, it just seems like a more robust in inspect mode when you're looking at the components, they know the exact padding, the specific font, also alt text has been really great for our developers. And it just seems like it's cut down on that back and forth. There's just a lot less of throwing it over the fence and saying, okay, here's what I, here's what is in my file. And then the engineers are saying, okay, well, this is what it looks like. And, and the designers, wait a minute, that's not exactly (laughs) what what I intended. And so I think that's really cut done on that in so many ways. And I think it could really just get even better. Also the prototyping within the side-by-side view is really great. So I think in in those sense, it just seems like it's been a game changer in terms of those small things that I think design has really had to do to make sure that the specifics with font and padding and all of those things. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's so perfect is much more condensed now and developers really understand this is the intent of the design. Yeah. Yeah, it really helps to communicate what's the final, final, final version of our design is. Right, <laughs> so, new final version. Yeah. So let's discuss about the features. I feel like some of the questions are related to the section that we will like to highlight. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to start? I see that you added some interesting, very detailed yeah, features course. that you really... Yeah. Actually, it's the main features that have improved really quickly or end over process the Flexbox uh, in particular, because it allowed uh, designers to pretty much understand uh, what they are actually designing, what are the margin and padding uh, subjects. For some designers, they don't have for the moment a a really tech-oriented oriented oriented mindset. So it was a good approach to uh, put a name on uh, what are the, the, what is margin, what is padding for for the first and uh, for the second of course it allows uh, designers to much more uh, rationalize rationalize for, sorry uh, their their work beside that we have of course all the plugin for the moment we have some really uh, motivated de- developers that are actually trying uh, some plugin because now they can use it as a, as a viewer. That's a really game changer too. They tried some plugin to, of course, to create, to generate some proper code, more proper than what is proposed by default. Um, mm-hmm. And they're actually really time saving. That's really cool. And of course, we talked about it a lot, but the ready for two dev sections, Actually, it was one of the main pain from the dev side is that when they arrived on the Figma files, they could be really lost and the ready to dev mode allowed them to arrive on a really clean interface with much more guidance. And it's also a way to show the designers how they could improve. It's a nudge for me on uh, how, okay, I, I, I know I can now improve easily uh, mm-hmm. the end of the end over. The tool actually is actually telling me how to do that easily. So I can see now a, a lot of good behavior 
behavior uh, from the designers that, that are using this particular option because it's a really easy one to use. And yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll let you, uh, Lisa. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I feel it's all the same things that our team is really loving about this. And it, your notes here were great. And I agreed with all of them. And then I just added a few things. Like I said, the side-by-side -side changes in design are really great. The last edited frame has been really huge. It really helps developers understand those small changes that are happening that could be those pixel perfect little tweaks that you need to that communicate to the developer. So I think that's really helpful. And, and yeah, just even the connection to Storybook and GitHub has been really phenomenal for our team. Even as I was saying, we're going through this huge change with our design system and it's just going to be even better once we get it up and, and running and, and put into, have that connection so that our engineers can be able to use it and be able to have that understanding of all the different changes and tweaks that we have going on. So yeah, I mean, the features are amazing. I think nobody can deny that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I feel we there was a, one question around Zeppelin, and I would love to go back into this question as well, because before Figma, when, when people introduced Figma, they were saying that Figma could cover multiple tools all in once. And one of the tools that they were mentioning that Figma could replace is Zeppelin. But right now with investing into dev mode, they are opening up new doors. And also by setting up the pricing so high, $25 per month for engineers, I feel tools like Zeppelin and Vyxpin and others have interesting market opportunity to go deeper into this topic and maybe provide more value to engineers. But I feel like the, the, the whole point of dev mode is not actually design in Figma part is more related to the Visual Studio code. And here I added a couple of things. And Nicholas, I really like your point about plugins because what I've seen so far, some teams are doing some really interesting stuff by using OpenAI API and by giving some more context around your current code base you can actually do the better handoff, better code generation, instead of just taking the values that Figma generates, but by investing time in your own plugin with understanding of your own code base and the way how your engineers are writing code, you can actually have really good suggestions in this plugin section, what kind of code could be generated out of that by using this open AI and giving more context on that. And one of the things that I wanted to discuss, and I feel Oops, open, opens up a lot of interesting opportunities is the integrations within the dev mode. As Nicholas mentioned, the plugins right now are available and people could do more things. And one of my thoughts here was that they are giving more window to new integrations in the future. So I know that we have features and plugins right now, but I hope in the future by connecting specific frames, by connecting specific sections with different plugins will be able to maybe pull some data from Dovetail or maybe pull some data from Amplitude around the, some metrics around specific screens if people will organize and will connect the dots within the Figma all together. Another thing, yes, as we mentioned, interactions, and there is a quick recording, quick highlight from the office hours from Figma where they are speaking about how easily for engineers you can quickly go through and see the things that you are interested about what kind of variables people use, what kind of components are available within the design. And the whole point of the dev mode is having dev experience rather than design experience because developers are interested in different things rather than designers. And, and, and as I mentioned, I feel like the main value proposition of the dev mode is not within Figma, it's within the Visual Studio code because I was really impressed with this demo from, I forgot his name. But he, he just showed the way how you can just start typing the name of the class in CSS. 
that will be related to the frame in Figma and it will provide all these parameters. What is the size? What kind of variables do you have within the Figma file? And again, as we discussed by using these plugins and by using some open AI APIs, you can actually have these recommendations even better tailored to your needs, tailored to the way how engineers are working. Another thing that I really loved is the breadcrumbs. And this is something interesting and it's changes and it's if there is a goal to connect design and engineering better, the breadcrumbs functionality that they presented is a game changer. So the way how it works right now, engineers can connect engineering things to the Figma, back to Figma. So within this example, if you will watch the recording, you will understand it better. So in this example, they were sharing that, oh, we are working on this specific component. And before that, for engineers, it was hard for them to share a comment to designers and say, oh, we developed this component. Please add a link to the com documentation here. Now, instead of that, they could do that directly from the Visual Studio Code, from the environment that they used to. So if they're developing a specific component, they can just connect the specific component to the Figma component. So the next time when another engineer will work on this specific screen or specific flow, they will see that somebody else from engineering side engineering team connected this engineering component to the design. So again, this is more technical, but it truly helps to connect these two worlds together. And again, as I mentioned, I feel like the main value proposition of the dev mode is within Visual Studio Code, not within the Figma itself. Great. Lisa, Nicolas, do you have any observations or maybe reactions at this point? Well, yeah, about the VS Code. For me, it's maybe the best, the best part of the dev mode. And of course, unfortunately, we don't have the time, neither the capacity to onboard for the moment or main developers to use this functionality. So uh, we don't have any insights on that. But mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a developer's <laughs> point of view, as a de designer's point of view, it seems to be just incredible. I would love to to see someone to just to to show us how he changed his way of working as a developer. Yeah, and I highly recommend checking out the office hours from Figma because it was more engineering focused, and seeing things from engineering world was really interesting. And this breadcrumbs functionality is truly helps to connect the dots together. So I was really excited about that. So uh, we have another section related to uh, called limitations. Nicholas, would you like to share, shed some light into this topic? Yeah, actually it's pretty much more mix, but we have to keep in mind some pretty much maybe hidden limitation. If we stay on the inspect mode, for example, we can't export unlock the files, any assets, and well, actually, uh, at least on the design system libraries in Orange, we normally always lock the files to, uh, to don't have any leak from viewers of the design system. So for the moment, we can handle it because the dev mode allow the viewers who are developers to export some assets, but it's, it, can be, it can be a pretty much a huge pain if we are not on the dev mode. After that, we have the small, small features of... I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Nicholas, can you please elaborate on the locked files? Yeah. Are you referring to locked files, the ones that people don't have editing access, so that's why they are not able to export things? Or are you locking the frames itself? No, no, it's the first case, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when they don't have editing access to the file, they are not able to export anything from the file, right? Yeah, exactly. That was my, how to say that? Well, it was. Two, two days ago, uh, mm -hmm. my developers went to me and to to tell me that they could not be able to export 
anything from the design stem library. And with dev mode, they can. Did yeah. they change the, the rule? Because before that, if there was export set up by designer, engineers could still download things, right? So now, did they change the rules? I don't know, actually. I really don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'll need to go deeper into that topic, but it will be really interesting to know if they, because before that, the way how it worked, designers could set up specific icons or assets as exportable. So then, then engineers could download the assets. Yeah. But even engineers didn't have editing access. So I can see that there, you know, within your file, the, there is a button called as to edit. So that's mean, that means that the person who is observing this file, this person has only viewing access, right? Yeah. But exactly. the export is disabled. This is really interesting. I will need to go deeper into this topic. Maybe they are changing some rules here. I'm not sure. Yeah, keep, keep, me, keep me informed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody from the audience knows if they changed anything here, because it will be really interesting to go deeper into that. It was kind of a surprise, actually. We also have the, the, yeah, the, the fact that uh, we have to hold the option key. And for some of all developers, it was kinda, kind of, how would say that? Interesting. This behavior, we're going to invest in. OK, thanks, Alexia. Um, and for the worst case, well, yeah, because actually, our point of view is always to keep in mind that something can, well, we have to prepare for the worst and we have to hope for the best and we will take what comes for the moment. What we are, have to handle day by day is the management of the licenses mm -hmm. uh, because we, have, we are on the organi organization plan pretty much difficult for, for us to just to be sure that there, there are not viewers that are promoting themselves as editors. So we will then have to pay for them. And I just hope for the, hope for the moment that it will not be the same you know, mechanism for the dev mode. Well, I, I think we can call that pretty much some deceptive pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so even for the licenses, it's really a mess for us. We just hope that we, it will not be the same for the dev mode handling uh, licenses. Yeah. And yeah, the, the last point, I, I think we already went through that, but it's how everyone have to create, it, to create some homemade solution just to have a proper versioning and over without any disruption or modification from unwanted modification from designers or just pushes from libraries. Yeah, just to follow on Lisa's points, where is the that frame with ready for dev on the dev line, the mode live? Do you, yeah, do you speak about the section? No, Kyle just added a link to the discussion that we had on needing edit access to export assets. Thank you very much for sharing. But back to the original question on the Lisa's point, where is that frame with the ready for dev? This is the actual feature is not, will, it will not be based on the dev mode license or not, because designers will have all the dev mode functionality available for them for free if they have editing seats, right? So even if organization will not want to move into dev mode in 2024, engineers will still see this ready for dev statuses and still use it. They will just not have that. This is more like an entry point for the dev mode experience, right? So. Even in 2024, designers can still use it to communicate which designs are final, 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 as we discussed before. So yeah, this is one of the things that it, it, it's really important to keep in mind. But Nicholas, you raised a really good point around these hidden patterns. I agree. A lot of discussions are happening on that on the community side as well. But I'm curious to know, Lisa, do you, did you face any challenges on that? On 
from the budgeting perspective. Are you preparing yourself to manage all these cases in the 2024? Preparing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we all deal on the design up side of things with true ups if you're on an org plan. And so I have to be, I'm that person that goes through and makes sure that we're not using any more seats than we said we would. I think it's going to end up being an even bigger headache once we get into dev mode, if we already use mm -hmm. it. Um, and also we have some engineers already that are having editor seats within Figma. And it tends to be this game of, well, how often are they using it? Do we just want to be designers? Can product people have editing seats? And mm -hmm. it tends to cause a lot of confusion around who should have those editor seats. And then I have to track some of those people down and say, what are you needing this for? You can just be a viewer if you need to have inspect mode or have those conversations. So I think it's looking at what are the pros and cons of moving into paying for it. Can we afford that price? for $25 a person, does it make sense maybe to move into enterprise, but that then is also just a whole other conversation to have, whether it's worth it to move into the enterprise plan. So yeah, there's a lot of discussion going on right now about what fits best with the size of our team and how do we then keep track of those true ups. Mm -hmm. Love it. Louisa, you also added some links some screenshots from the onboarding materials. Would you like to share some of that with the audience? And please publicize yourself so people could follow. Thank you. Yeah. So we had put together, it's not spotlighting. Okay. One of my senior or lead designers put together some documentation and I asked if I could present it and he was kind enough to say, yeah, you can throw a screenshot in there. But we went through and actually had an all hands with the design teams and then ended up having conversations um, with specific squads about how to work with our developers and so, or how developers can actually understand Figma and how to use it. So we broke it down into just what are, what is the interface that they need to understand what are the different kinds of Figma seats? So editor, viewer, viewer restricted, and admin. And when people are saying, hey, can I move into an editor seat? They can maybe refer to this as to what they can and cannot do and what they need. And then just maybe a basic understanding. Here are the layers for now we have these ready for dev layers or what's live. And just explaining what our interfaces for that and what our standards are for our different pages. And then moving into what all of those different sidebars mean for the CSS and what or what they can use for commenting or, or exporting and just explaining that stuff. And then moving into the developer tools, we broke out basically what they would need for inspection and layout measurements what could be helpful for spacing, um, what they would want to be looking at when it comes to different shared styles and whatnot, and then exporting images and assets. And then we thought it would be really good to dig into more common questions and issues that maybe developers might be seeing or having and addressing those. And then one thing, I don't think I have a screenshot in here, was just like best practices and just different quick commands that they can use. So this has been really helpful. And again, I said, we have documentation too for how to hand off between design and engineering. And this is being updated right now for dev mode as we speak. So I see a lot of cursors are going through the common questions and issues. They are very curious to know <laughs> what are the, mo the most common questions. Do you, would you like to share one of them? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times for engineers, when they're coming into this, it's essentially how can I find what I need within here and how to use the, the inspect mode? And then 
I explored an element, but it's not the one I wanted to. I thought was really interesting how to mitigate some of those things that maybe they thought they were using correctly and and aren't. And then I think this tends to be a really big issue is the padding. It's, I can't zoom in anymore, but we have it titled, Why Are There Weird Distances Between Layers? And so talking about that and the side effects of mm. exporting versus making sure that you're double checking that and you're highlighting the correct layer, not necessarily the component and that there's layers nested within layers. That I think is something that tends to be an issue when you're jumping into Figma for the first time. Love it. I know we are out of time. Some of the things that we also wanted to discuss, Nicholas, thank you very much for sharing one of your Figma playground files. I know we're out of time, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Do you want to quickly go through that? Well, I can really do that really quickly. Actually, mm -hmm. I haven't reinvented the wheel, of course. The idea is to create a, a proper documentation to, to allow the developers to feel engaged in, in Figma. And mm -hmm. well, as I said, the dev mod was a really good opportunity to do so. So it's like, what is Figma? Why it allow us a better collaboration? Uh, mm -hmm. What is what are the main interfaces that developers have to use? So left panel, right panel, etc. Also, I'm sorry, it's really pixelized, but this was a presentation of the navigation panel panel with our custom ways of structuring each mm -hmm. uh, files, Figma files, and then yeah. We have the presentation of the dev mode, the versioning, of course, how to how how we will proceed to to use the versioning branches, and the VS Code. It was just to tell them, hey, look at that. You can do awesome thing with that. We don't have the time to onboard you on that, but yeah, we, you should definitely try it on your own. And then yeah, just think about how to do a really quick and really. Well, we try to, to be as efficient as possible. So just mm -hmm. reusing the, the playground, that the beautiful playground created by Figma in the community files, and well, using our own, of course, uh, interfaces. And yeah, that's pretty much all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, Lisa and Nicholas, to for investing your time into the community and sharing more light into this topic. 